was a, a really remarkable summary of the progress that's been made in New York over the last several years. And in combination with, you know, the opportunities provided by the Endless Frontier Act and America Leads Act and the additional state investment, I think the community can really see that we are poised to take off. We're at an inflection point at the moment. Um, and it's a very exciting place to be even in spite of the pandemic. So um, yeah, I would just love to hear, when you hear about the Endless Frontier Act and these other, um, these other opportunities to bring additional investment into the city, how are you thinking about organizing to make the city competitive to get these resources? Well, I think, I think it's exciting, right? From particularly how you framed it, Nancy, it's, it's potential to double the investment, right? That the, that the state and city have offered. Uh, I think as far as organizing, we have a lot of those great routes uh, to be able to do this, right? It's going to take uh, many partnerships and areas of focus. I think the, the compelling piece from what uh, Senator Schumer's office mentioned is that uh, while there is, there is and will be a focus on the biotech industry, which this group's certainly interested in, it will also cross over into other areas of technology. And I think that's a significant advantage for New York City, both um, generally uh, of the rise of technology companies and technology and engineering-based cultures over the past 12 years in New York, but also that intersection of technology and science that we see every day in New York City. Uh, and I think that that's the piece that um, through both the research institutions, the universities, but quite frankly, a lot of the innovation that is, that is translating to company creation, I think we're ripe to be able to not only capture some of that, but, um, but have it advance even more so uh, as we learn more about you know, when it will happen and, and what that really means for New York City and the state. Right, right. So I would love to get some questions in here from our audience. Um, this was a question that, um, that is posed by Denise Aronson, Safety Partners, one of our corporate members. How many incubator graduates have thus far moved up into their own lab facility in New York City? Um, thanks, Denise, for the question. Um, it's, a, it's a good question. I think it's, it's something we're probably watch it. I don't have a, a total number for you right now, but I think it's, you know, the, the situations of the Valestras of the world, we're starting to see that happen more and more. I think a number of firms have grown out of the space in, in launch labs, uh, which is why they've, they've doubled down on additional investments. Um, some of those companies may have stayed within the East or West Tower, uh, or maybe looking at um, being able to expand into Long Island City. Uh, I think some coming out of J Labs and some coming out of Biolabs will continue to see more. I mean, I think we've got to remember uh, it's still early stages of this uh, as far as being able to look at that growth and capture that growth. And just a few years ago, and not only did we, did we not have the incubators, but uh, I can remember in conversations like these, we just didn't have a path to get the expansion space at all. And so I think we'll, we'll start to see more of that uh, in the years to come. Great. I want to bring Loretta Bine into this conversation from the Empire State Development so we can get really the state and city talking and answering these questions. We can get both perspectives. Um, Loretta, welcome. Do you want to give a brief introduction? I'm sorry, I don't have your background or bio since it was late this morning that you agreed to join. And thank you for joining us. Thank oh, you. my pleasure. Yeah, I'm so pleased. Um, thanks, Mitch, and thanks, Nancy. And Doug, you gave away our playbook. So <laughs> um, you told the world how New York City and New York State actually pulled this off to this degree. But um, to get back to business here, I, I will tell you that, um, so I work with Eric at New York State's Economic Development Agency, Empire State Development. And my role at ESD is to Kind of um, help identify companies that want to make an expansion or create jobs or have an opportunity to grow and might need some collaboration or partnership. So there's lots of things that uh, Eric went over, over you know what the state does and what we can provide as resources, not just funding. But um, yeah, so I'd be happy to talk to any of the people attending about that in the future. And I really thank you for including me in this conversation. 
of question and answers. Terrific. Well, let's bring a couple of other questions in here. Um, or maybe I can, I can pose uh, something to you, which I saw last weekend, which was unfortunate. And I think it's one of the reasons that we actually started organizing, Mitch, you and I, three years ago to promote this. Um, we just saw a company that was actually headquartered at J-Labs, Autonomous Therapeutics, and went public there move their operations to Rockville, Maryland. Um, and this is exactly you know, what the city and state has been trying to prevent, you know, to keep New York companies in New York. You wanna just comment on that um, and you know, how we can uh, encourage the startups that are coming out of the incubators right now to stay and expand here. So you're right, that is a, a risk that we're taking that you um, put in all this incubator space and you create opportunity, investment and collaboration. And then some company may have to follow the money or for some other reason, um, people make location decisions on a variety of subjects. It's not always um, money, but yeah, I mean, in the 90s, <laughs> New York State opened incubators for technology throughout the state in life sciences, in, um, in uh, wireless technology, all, all sorts of things. And um, what we found is that there was no outcome commitment to keep them here. So um, all the people that Doug and Eric mentioned in this path and this discussion, we, we find that um, we're all in the same mission to kind of identify how to grow the industry here and to then to keep them here is the trick um, and to have that rich infrastructure and the turnaround so that uh, companies have places to locate when they advance um, to the next stage. So there's no, you know, we can't hold them here, but we can create the environment that is attractive for them. And that's been a lifelong problem. You know, there's, like I said, location decisions could be as simple as well this is where my grandchildren are, are being raised yeah. and I want to be there and then you know there's the other part that we're putting together for for the industry and and related industries I mean Doug was mentioning technology and how closely they're uh, aligned now with um you know life sciences and biotech and um you know having that rich culture in New York City and in New York State so that we have every kind of job here from you know finance to entertainment to everything that you can think of um, that that is an environment that will keep people um, wanting to be here the major university systems just I think um, flaunting our infrastructure and our assets and um, helping those people come out of the world you know I know we're all in lockdown so to speak to some degree but um, to communicate and have that collaboration and partnership is really going to make a difference um, getting companies to decide to stay here. Mm. Doug, do you have any, any comments on that? I mean, I think Loretta answered that very well and just accurately of what's, what's realistic, right? Um, while you never wanna see a company leave um, at that stage, I think you know, our job at the city and state is to change the landscape. So companies have options and opportunities to uh, assess, can they start here, stay here at all stages of growth? And so, you know, will the city and state's efforts be able to capture every company and every great scientific idea to stay within the city and state? No. Uh, but I think it's, it's providing those options. And as Loretta said, sometimes it's decisions that are out of the infrastructure's hands, right? It's not just a, uh, a piece where you start getting into personal decisions of maybe, maybe the, uh, the venture backing uh, wants close proximity to the company. Maybe, as, as Loretta mentioned, there are personal reasons that are driving uh, people to go out by any means. But I think it's incumbent on us to continue on those options and not only be focused on, on space. And I think both through the city, state, and private sector's efforts, we've come a long way in five years uh, where you know, that might not even been a decision um, five years ago because there just wasn't an option at all. And I think we're starting to see that landscape. And from what at least from what I hear, and, and probably more of this will come out late on later today's panel, as well as next week, uh, we're starting to see more of that, uh, those candidates for step out really be able to come and stay in New York City. Will it be everyone? No, uh, but starting to have a, those paths to take that next phase and then eventually go into some of these larger campus developments. 
I think that's where we're really excited about the opportunity for companies. I would say, Doug, certainly uh, you can't stop if there's personal reasons why people move, they do that, and there's not a whole lot any of us can do. But certainly the city and the state can coordinate their efforts. And I think that's, that's the key, is that you work as a team. Um, even if someone, for reasons that, that aren't clear to us at this second, that may not want to stay in the city, that doesn't preclude them from staying within the state. And uh, because there's, there's, the feeder program works both ways. As these companies are growing, they get spinoffs that we could then recapture and put that back into the program. Um, Which that, that's a really good point because the governor did put together the Startup New York program, which um, you know leads companies throughout the state in different technology industries. So you could locate in a Startup New York um, zone and um, you could be on a campus with collaborative minds and be in a specific campus like maybe life sciences or um, some other technology. And then you can build on your company's assets by using the resources of the university. You also get internships and you can hire while you're there from the, you know, from the campus. So to create that thread and that bond, a reason for people to, um, you know, want to stay here because we're hiring all these great people or there's other resources like the university or the hospital systems. So um, that's not just in New York City, but throughout the New York State. And it's right. another way to advance um, the technology industries. Great, well, we have, um, we have an individual with their hand up. So I'm gonna call on Brian Darmody um, to talk. He is the CEO of the American um, Association of University Research Parks. Brian? Brian, are you there? Okay, well, let's see. We do have a couple of questions um, in the chat box. One is from uh, John Pennett at Eisner Amper. Is the city and state providing support for entrepreneurial developments? How do entrepreneurs access? And John's firm represents a number of, um, of these, these firms. Um, I'm, I'm happy to jump in there. So John, um, good to hear from you and, and thanks for the question. I think for, from a city's perspective, um, we have historically, invent, you know, a couple of the programs that were wildly successful and mentioned were SBI or Impact and ELAB NYC, um, which I you know you're familiar with at least one of those um, from, from firsthand experience. Um, those were some of the initial proving grounds to be able to say, um, to, to go to City Hall and, and ask for additional commitment on the large infrastructure pieces. Um, I think there's a, a deep commitment to uh, continuing to invest in that entrepreneurial talent. I think a lot of our efforts with LifeSci NYC um, had to focus on the, the changing the real estate footprint, both uh, of incubators, step out space and larger campuses, uh, which took a lot of time and resources. I don't think that's something that we want to um, stay away from supporting uh, entrepreneurs. I think a lot of that's happened through the incubators that are coming. I think besides just having that shared space, you've got different accesses to programming and a, an entrepreneur spirit that are happening both in um, physical nature at those wet lab incubators, some of the accelerator programs uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, I think, you know, Loretta can talk more on Indie Bio. I think that's, a, you know, another entrant that is is new to New York City and how it can support companies. So I, I don't think we're we're short on that. The city is is certainly interested and will continue to watch that. I think beginning of this year, we were at a phase to assess that of what else um, could be could be done or might be needed. Um, certainly since March, uh, some of our efforts have been refocused just as everyone else, but I but I would say it's something that we'll continue to watch because we recognize how how important it is. Thus the the community slide um, that I talked to. But Loretta, if, if you have other aspects that you'd like to touch on. Yeah, it's just the partnership and us working together with not just um, universities, academia, but actually real estate. You know, now I think that I talk to in my role more real estate folks than I ever did before. 
And that's not just to help companies, large companies site space, but where can I put my small company or what um, resources would be available if I did start my incubator company, you know, if I did have an incubator size company here, and then what do I do when I'm ready to expand? I don't want to let the employees that I hired that I trust and um, we grew this business together. I don't want to let them go. I want to be able to stay here. Is there going to be space for me? And um, Matt's going to tell us all about how that worked out for his company in a little while. But um, basically, I think the communication that we're doing, the partnership, you know, working together, like Mitch mentioned, it's not going to, you know, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. We all have all this like-minded um, initiative where we want to really see this work. We've been waiting so long uh, for growth and development, and now to say that um, science may happen faster. I'm not a scientist. I'm just saying that from um, the technology and the genome and all the other things that have changed in the world over the last 10 years. I think things have the capacity to happen faster. And at the same time, we have the um, pathway for people to, to remain here during that quick, you know, for the bio world, we'll call it quick, um, uh, drive forward. So we've got another question here. Um, can you tell us when the EDC will be considering expansion space fund applications again, especially considering all the new projects coming online soon? Um, thanks, Nancy, for the question. And I think that probably came from Yasmin amongst others. Um, so thanks for the question. So what, um, for those who don't know what, what, sh what the question's referring to is a program that we launched a couple of years ago that was designed to really help with that gap of when you come out of an incubator, uh, you know, we found that a lot of CEOs and chief scientific officers were running around with the real estate community trying to figure out where can I go next for the reason to stay. So we created a $10 million program called the Expansion Space Fund, which was designed to work with companies to help with that dilemma, help with the use that capital to fit out the space, uh, but rather than providing it in a, in a form of a grant, uh, do so in a loan um, convertible note and or equity. Um, so it could, could become an evergreen fund. The major focus for that was really helping companies with that Delta of, um, bid out for space kind of on top of what the real estate developers were doing for tenant improvement. So that's the background. Um, and part of that was, you know, I mentioned the Manhattanville project, part of those proceeds were used to help outfit some of that, that lab. Um, I, I would love to, to give a timeline uh, on that. I, it's a question we get daily, um, and it's something that our team is certainly excited about. I think based on the, the current budget situation, that's something that I, I can't realistically say there's a timeline on it just based on uh, you know, a number of our things across the city. We just, in March, we had to put a pause on. What I would, what I would ask the community is to continue asking that question and continue coming to both myself and our team. We know the demand for this is high. Uh, we have socialized that internally and, and would like to be able to come back to this community knowing that's one of the biggest priorities of what companies need to continue the growth. So um, sorry that I don't have a better answer on, on timeline. Uh, we know the significance and importance for it and, uh, and, and hope to have uh, a better outlook for that uh, down the road soon. Great. Here's a question from Joe Bellano. Um, as mentioned, other amenities, shopping, theater, transportation that New York has to offer have been attractive to researchers coming here, but how do you see the, the pandemic and the current state of New York City affecting the decision of companies to remain or leave? Yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's something we're all going through, right? Um, no matter no matter whether people are in the city or commuting in from the suburbs or, or throughout um, the state. Um, it's, it's hard in the sense to, to realize that, but I think what, what might be different from other industries in that is the, this is going to be the industry that helps us get out of that pandemic. Not only this one, but you know, future outbreaks and future, future elements. So the ability to live in New York City or through the tri-state area and be able to focus and develop good science and be in and around some of those amenities as they come back, I think will remain attractive. It may not be for everyone, but I think the ability to be a part of that recovery is something that we've seen time and time again through different stages of um, you know, uh, 
major issues happening throughout New York City. New York City's proven to be very re resilient, as has uh, neighbors in, in adjacent states and certainly throughout New York State. And so I think it's it will take an element of focusing on that good science, wanting to be here, uh, and then you know, is it is it something where companies or people within those companies want to be a part of that recovery? Uh, and if so, I think you've got good ingredients to do that, uh, as well as different locations throughout the tri-state area that, that you can um, still be able to have access to that. Mitch, did you have some thoughts of that? I, I see. Oh, no, I was sitting here thinking, and, and you know, the issue is, and it's, it's, a, it's a fair question. Unfortunately, there's no place to go because all the other cities are faced with the exact same dilemma. So I think whatever attracts a business, a life science business in particular, to start in New York City, um, those same reasons and rationale to me would be the same reasons for them to stay. Um, whether the amenities are, are different here uh, because of the pandemic, unfortunately it is, it is universal across the country. Um, and I can tell you that there are great efforts being made to try to change that, but unfortunately it is what it is. And there's one other uh, anonymous question, um, which actually was going to be my question, but I will give it credit to the anonymous uh, submitter, which is what is the latest on the proposal that firms bid on with the $100 million EDC push to create the biotech hubs that goes back, I don't know, how long ago was that? Four or five years ago when that started? Quite that long, but um, so the, what, that long, I understand, I understand that. So, um, you know, I mentioned that Deerfield was the first of the announcement coming from that uh, back in September of last year. Um, to be fair that, you know, that program was, um, that challenge was released January of 2018. So it has been some time. Um, I think we had been prepared through both that as well as the applied R&D facilities program, which was a $50 million allocation. Um, to be moving forward with an, a number of different programs uh, and had been uh, very excited about those projects. Uh, as the pandemic hit, uh, a number of those conversations um, had paused based on, um, that was our remit, a lot of both my team and, and team at EDC, much like the state, had to refocus efforts on the COVID recovery and, and planning for recovery. So um, fair question. Um, it's they're still in active discussions, and, and I suspect we will hear about things um, uh, over the coming year. To follow up on that, on the fifty million dollar infrastructure initiative, you know, um, there's been a lot of uh, talk and also launching new initiatives, especially out um, on the West Coast around engineering biology and creating kind of the, the new um, manufacturing facilities that are needed uh, to allow the biomanufacturing industry to supply a range of businesses with the quantities of chemicals that are sustainable and at a low price necessary to uh, help grow these industries. We have a number of companies that are growing in New York City right now, like C16 Biosciences and Helena, that are using the approaches of synthetic biology and they need new kinds of facilities, which the city doesn't have right now. Um, any thoughts on you know, creating centers for engineering biology in New York? So it's a it's a fair question, Nancy. I think um, we are we're constantly looking to see, both, you know, pre-pandemic and after, you know, where are the gaps within New York City, and trying to let the the data drive that. So um, to say, are there immediate plans for that? Um, you know, th there may be, but I think it's it's something that right now I think um, as a city we've we've got to focus on the recovery. I think life sciences and healthcare. Uh, will be at the center of that in a variety of different forms. And, and that's something that whether it's, whether it's our efforts, the state's efforts, or things happening through the private sector or academic institutions, we'd certainly encourage that. Um, I think, you know, you mentioned a couple companies that are rising stars in this. I also think, um, you know, the, the addition of an organization like an Indie Bio coming in brings a different lens uh, for that to help those early stage companies. They have a lot of experience from the West Coast doing it. 
Um, so, it, you know, it's, it's certainly something to watch um, locally and see where that cascades throughout the five boroughs and throughout the state. Yeah, and really, I think that that would be industry driven and we would hope that it would be industry driven because we just don't like the New York State and New York City and other government entities don't have the finances to be the lead in a project like that. So, um, you know, when people have ideas and have initiatives and they come to us for either seed money or part of the development or, you know, just having the partnership. I think if something like that is industry driven that 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 we could get all in on that and um, there's a lot of work similar to what you're explaining um, in Feinstein on Long Island. So, uh, you know, we see it happening in New York State and we're hoping for it to continue in advance. Yeah, I mean, industry driven, this is um, a new initiative called BioMade, which was spearheaded by the Department of Defense and which includes lots and lots of companies alongside of them to invest 275 million in a biomanufacturing facility like this. And I'm glad you brought up Indy Bio, Doug, because you're right, they've been very active in this area on the West Coast. I would love to see them bring their efforts um, specifically in the area of synthetic biology to New York City, um, because it's we do have companies that are developing here and um, and it's very important. And on that note, there's a book out by Arvin Gupta and uh, Poe Branson called Decoding the World, which is really a very easy read, but a good read about um, the solutions to many of our global problems right now that this type of biology and biological engineering can bring. Um, so it's kind of exciting and we're gonna hear from him as a closing keynote speaker at the end of uh, this symposium. So, hey, Nancy, just comment on both tying in your comment and, and Mitch's as well. I think, um, while it may not be synthetic, but biology related, I think the, you know, Mitch brought up a theme of, you know, based on this happening everywhere that, you know, company, companies and people are going to choose to be here because they want to. And I think from an industry perspective, one of the things that has been a, a strength is that intersection of other industries into life sciences, right? We talked a little bit on the intersection of technology and science. That can be hardcore engineering, like sy synthetic biology, or it could be data science, right? And being able to watch that, or you know, through the pandemic, I think you know Loretta can probably speak to this too, just based on both the state and city's recovery. I mean, in the efforts of both PPE as well as uh, sourcing for diagnostic testing. We, we probably partnered with over 70 companies, um, some in, in industries that were advanced manufacturing or the fashion industry to be able to um, get products and supplies in need to frontline healthcare workers or other areas. So I think that will continue, that resiliency will continue throughout New York City and New York State, both in pandemic times, but certainly well beyond. And, and if that crosses over to synthetic biology, that's great, right? To, to see companies form and be able to develop that as a, as a you know, local or regional center. Uh, but I think we'll see more of that intersection and cross-pollination of industries really be able to advance great ideas, great science for good commercial opportunities. Yeah. So here's another question. What has been your, this is um, from Jeff Wang, an entrepreneur in residence at the Downstate Biotechnology Incubator. What has been your experience with debt lenders versus equity providers to assist in infrastructure development? Um, so I, I think ours is probably in, in seeing some of the projects that we've talked about, um, you know, firsthand, whether it, you know, several of the, the larger expansions, expansion campuses that were mentioned, uh, I think we've seen a wide range and, and it's probably the next panel that can talk to this much more about, uh, as large real estate projects are announced. Uh, those entities and developers and joint ventures need to think through the financing piece for this. So, um, you know, we've seen a wide range in, in some of those partnerships of serious capital committed behind the scenes to be able to enable some of these real estate projects. Um, that can certainly happen at the company level too. There are uh, venture debt and venture financing arms that will support young companies with growth as well. But I think from uh, a larger real estate 
uh, perspective, I think that's something that's been exciting for us to see in New York City is some pretty significant investment firms backing these industries in different geographies through the city. Great. Um, he says, perfect, thank you. So that's, that was a good answer. Um, Mitch, do you have any further questions uh, for Doug or Loretta? No, I don't, but thank you both. It's been a really terrific uh, morning. Thank you. Yeah, it's very exciting to hear about all of the new opportunities, all of the progress, you know, the huge amount of progress, especially in the last five years. And the fact that the New York City uh, life science marketplace is really being transformed. Um, and then the opportunities uh, kind of to come, which are very exciting and which can give us a lot to organize around in the coming months. So uh, stay tuned everyone uh, for ways to pitch in and help out uh, both in terms of building the coalition of support for these new legislative initiatives, but also organizing ourselves to apply uh, to actually receive some of that funding. Um, so I'm going to just have us take a short break 